Hi, my name is Eta320, and I really, really like tanks. So much so that I've decided to embark on a journey across the internet and gaming world alike to find some of the wackiest, coolest, and most well-made tanks in video games. I'll be looking at everything from the plausibly realistic to the downright insane. This tank could physically not work in real life for one simple reason, I'll tell you why. So if this sounds like something you're interested in, stick around and listen up, because this is A Tank Enthusiast Reacts to Tanks in Video Games. Actually, before we can just jump into this, I would like to clarify a couple of things. First of all, as you may notice by the title, this is Tank Enthusiast Reacts. I really, really like tanks. I've done a lot of research on them and think I can pretty confidently navigate my way around a tank and tank discussions, but I would like it to be known that I'm not an expert. I am not a historian or a museum employee. And I'll leave links to really nice people down in the comments and description of this video so you can do your own research if anything I say here today entices you. That being said, if your, my credibility does come into question, I've made plenty of videos on tanks, so if you want to know what I know, then go ahead and just watch those. Or join my Discord, because I do have a Discord and we talk about tanks quite a lot on there as well. Anyway, let's jump into this. All right, GTA 5. Man, this this is a game I have not played in a long time until I ended up gathering the footage for this video. And this is uh, the Rhino Tank, as it's so called. Many of you veteran GTA 5 players know very well. Back in the old days, this was like the most OP ground vehicle you could get. And now they have flying DeLoreans that shoot missiles. So I find it quite sad how easily GTA was able to make a tank obsolete. Right, so straight off the bat, there's a couple of things that strike me about this tank. GTA 5 kind of has a fun little quirk of their cars. They kind of take the general gist of a vehicle that exists in real life and then sort of slightly and gently add their own little flavors to it. So on a macro scale, you look at one of their cars and you say, oh yeah, that's a Lamborghini. But then you start looking at the micro details of it and you start realizing that it's not really a Lamborghini, or at the very least, it's not any specific model of Lamborghini that exists in real life. And it would seem they've applied their skills to this tank as well. Upon immediate first glance, the macro image I'm getting is Leopard 2A4. That's pretty much my indistinct reaction is a Leopard 2A4 or some kind of derivative of it, but once we start looking a little bit closer into it, I'm sure that we'll find details that are not at all going to be Leopard 2A4, and I'm already on the snapshot, I can see that it it's not really a Leopard 2A4. Really, I'm noticing the gun barrel is kind of wobbling up and down. Um, either there's a person in the turret right now, or somebody forgot to engage the travel lock. Right, so I'm not noticing any sort of guide horns on the middle of the tracks, although we do have two sets of road wheels per wheel. The way the tank running gear system is usually set up is you have two wheels that kind of clamp together in the middle to form kind of, if you're looking at it on a profile, like an H. And then you have on your tracks, you have what are called guide horns that are meant to kind of slip into that groove created, that H shape in between the two road wheels, and so it kind of keeps the track running along the wheels. It's make sure you don't slip the tracks off. It's kind of a similar concept to the way a train keeps itself on rails. It's actually a pretty similar concept. Some tanks in World War II and after would have had the horns on the outside, so instead of slipping between two sets of wheels, they sit outside, keep the wheels guided in that way. But this doesn't seem to have any sort of depth to it at all. The model for these tracks is just a flat solid shape and there doesn't seem to be any depth, any guide horns or, or nothing on it. It pretty quickly reminds you that even though they've done a lot of updating to this game, it was still made in 2013. Front mounted idler wheel, sprockets in the back. You can usually tell which wheel is the sprocket or the idler wheel based on which one has the teeth. Tanks don't deliver power to all of their wheels. It was a big shock to me when I learned this years and years ago. The only wheel that receives power on a tank when you put your foot on the gas is the sprocket. And it's usually whatever wheel is gonna have teeth on it that mesh in with the tracks. Whether you have your sprocket mounted on the front or the rear is a debate that's been going on in the tank world since the dawn of time. 
Although it doesn't look like the sprocket really meshes with the track. It, well, it does. It clips into the tracks. Uh, you can tell that the tracks are not really a uh, modeled physics object in this game. They're just a flat texture that I'm sure just has a generic animation that plays to get it to look like the track is rolling. This tank almost certainly drives, in terms of how the game is making it work, using its road wheels. There's no way that these tracks actually have any physics baked into them. I can already tell me the track, the texture of the tracks is already moving on its own. Aside from the running gear, plenty of detail. You have what I, I think are spare track links on the front. That's pretty common for tanks. Uh, nowadays, you don't see it that much, but definitely back in World War II, the Cold War, you saw it all the time. Spare track links add additional armor, and also it's just, you know, you need to carry spare track links. So if you're going to carry them, might as well carry them on the front where the extra thickness of that steel will help you a little bit. The, the track links don't look like they particularly match the tracks of this tank, um, which by the way are most definitely modeled after an American style track, but they also at the same time don't look anything like a real American style track. The only thing I can really compare it to is that the texture on the front seems to be sort of that boxy chevron shape that uh, America has adopted and been using for decades, pretty much since World War II. A lot of bolts and bips on the front that don't seem like they actually do anything. Looks like the gun is probably the 120 used on the Leopard or uh, or the Abrams. The Leopard and the Abrams use the exact same cannon, the Rheinmetall 120 millimeter. They've clearly gone through some effort. We do have a coaxial machine gun, but it's practically impossible to tell what gun it's supposed to be. The barrel looks way too thick to be any sort of 7.62 or even really a 50 cal that I would imagine that sit there. I mean, it really looks like a... I want to say it looks like some kind of 20 mil autocannon, but I know for a fact that's not the case, and I know for a fact that that's not what they meant. Coaxial machine gun is basically just the secondary gun of the tank. Um, some tankers would argue it's the primary weapon of the tank, but it's basically just a machine gun, a fixed machine gun that sits right next to the main gun and the gunner in the turret can use that coaxial machine gun to shoot bad guys with bullets instead of giant tank shells. Why waste all your tank ammo on such a small target like an infantryman running across the street? You can just hose him down with a machine gun, it's fine. Also noticing there's some kind of viewport or something on the front. I don't know how useful that would really be at all. It seems like a very old-fashioned kind of clock it open and swing it open uh, viewport almost. Uh, I guess that could be some kind of viewport for the loader, since it seems to be on the loader side of the turret. Loaders don't usually get viewports, at least if they do, it's definitely not something like this that could compromise the jeopardy of the front of the tank. It would usually just be a little vision block like on the roof or something of the turret. Um, yeah, if that is supposed to be some kind of vision block or uh, vision port that the loader has the option of opening and closing, uh, I, I don't see why, because that is any, nothing but a weak spot on the front of the tank. Also, I did not notice uh, this at all while I was recording uh, any of this gameplay, but looking back at it now, this turret is riveted. <laughs> this turret is of riveted construction, which... Riveted construction is a very, very old-fashioned way of building tanks. We're talking pre-World War II. It's mostly a World War I concept, World War I interwar type concept. We threw out riveted tanks because although it was cheap and easy, because you can pretty much teach anyone to grab a riveter and rivet holes in something. In fact, uh, the UK did it mostly if you find a lot of World War II British tanks. So kind of what America did with the car industry, Britain did with the railroad industry. And so you have a lot of these tanks that Britain manufactured that came out of train factories and trains are made with riveting so the british riveted a bunch of their tanks in world war ii but eventually even they moved away from it the problem with riveting is that if you hit that tank hard enough with some kind of high explosive shell or even if it if you just hit it hard enough those rivets can come loose especially if you have rivets on the inside of the tank they can come loose and fly all around and spread shrapnel all inside the tank and injure potentially kill crew members it's also just not nearly as strong as say a weld or a, a cast as far as building tanks go, riveted construction is very outdated, so to see this here is pretty funny for the tank they're trying to portray.
They did actually bother with Gunner's vision block. That's where your Gunner would have his infrared scopes, his main gun vision scopes. See, they bother with smoke launchers, another, um, yeah, I'm assuming that these are vision ports. You got another vision port, kind of swing open vision port on the side of the turret there. Weirdly enough, you do have machine gun ammunition cases on the outside of the turret. You can do that, I guess there's no reason why you shouldn't, but traditionally ammunition is gonna be stowed inside the tank. Unless maybe it's some kind of ammunition that is supposed to be carried uh, for the squad, or if it's extra ammunition and inside the tank you already have thousands upon thousands of rounds, and this rack is just meant for if you wanna carry more thousands and thousands of rounds. Traditionally, you don't wanna have ammo sitting out there because if you need to reload your gun, you don't wanna to have to pop up out of the tank to grab your cases of ammunition. I'm sure that there are crews out there that would have done that, but I don't see a tank today coming out of the factory equipped with ammo boxes on the outside of the turret. It's, that's a little bit weird. Yeah, that was an accident. I didn't mean to do that. They have actually bothered to model a decently accurate uh, driver's position, so to speak, with these little uh, blocks that are supposed to be vision vision slits and vision periscopes, but they are missing glass, uh, missing any sort of fidelity and detail uh, at all. A hatch, it looks like, on the, uh, the left fender, and then some kind of oil, external fuel storage or something, on the right fender. We have a hatch that has no handle or hinges or anything, it's just a square piece of polygon. <laughs> the gunner's scope does not have any sort of geometry to it. Gunner seems to have a uh, periscope built into his hatch, which also looks to be a Soviet-style flip-up half-hatch, so to speak. Not really many Western tanks that I can think of off the top of my head have hatches like this. And uh, the gunner has his periscope built into that, which isn't a problem. I can't think of any modern tank that has a periscope built into the hatch. You seem to have a lot of naked room on this turret where they're just not using it for anything. There's only two hatches, which is plausible. And Commander's Coppola looks a lot more reasonable. He's got the all-round vision blocks. That's pretty standard on what you can see on most NATO tanks today and even most Soviet tanks. <laughs> Wait, hold on a second. <laughs> this tank could physically not work in real life for one simple reason. I'll tell you why. The s supposed driver's hatch or the, the, the crew hatch that we've seemed to have entered this tank from is lopsided off to the left and is directly above the tracks. <laughs> It's in the fender of the tank. He opens that hatch and just down below him would be the running gear, would be the idler wheel and the tracks. So he can't. And he just hops down into it as if there's some sort of interior compartment built into the, the tracks of the tank. He just phases right through it, I guess, which is very, very, very weird. They had a perfectly fine hatch somewhat, not really modeled there at the center, but they just didn't use it. I guess because, like a lot of tanks in real life, it looks like that that hatch is so cramped that you might have to swivel the turret out of the way in order to get into it, and I guess Rockstar just didn't want to have to bother with something like that. Or also, maybe they just wanted you to have to get in on the tank on the left side, because this is a game where you're driving cars 90% of the time, where you hop in from the left. They would know players would walk up to the tank from the left side, acting as if they're getting into a normal car, and so you hit Y and the animation is nice and quick. He climbs up on the left fender, opens a hatch, drops in, boom, you're in the tank in two seconds. Fair, but unrealistic. Uh, most tanks today have the driver in the center. You used to have drivers located either left or right in the tank because usually you'd have a bow machine gunner or uh, assistant driver, radio operator, a second crew member down in the hole with you next to the driver. And so there was a reason to have the driver on one side or the other. After World War II, countries were pretty quick to kick that guy out and just put the driver in the middle of the tank because that also made it a bit easier to export the tank because if you were exporting it to other countries that were driving on opposite sides of the road, yeah, they could get used to it, but it just kind of made it nicer to put the driver in the middle, made some more sense for the driver, also gave you more space to fit other things in the tank like uh, fuel tanks, extra ammunition, so have you. Interestingly though, the Leopard 2A4, the tank that I reckon this is quite well based off of, is one of the few modern tanks today that doesn't put the driver in the middle. They put their driver on the right 
which is the opposite of what they've done here in GTA. So they have the right idea, but they got the positioning wrong. And also he definitely doesn't just open a hatch into the fenders of the tank and falls in. The hatch is located in the hull where there would actually be space for him to go. So task failed successfully, I suppose. Pretty realistic actually for turret traverse. Modern tanks today have really sophisticated and advanced motors, uh, electrical powered motors and traverse mechanisms that can really spin turrets around quite quickly. They really can spin their turrets about that fast. Pretty fast, pr pretty quick tank. I wouldn't say this is an unrealistic speed at all for the tank to be going. Definitely not as fast as that guy. The average is probably gonna be 40 miles an hour if I had to hit it hard, mostly because tanks are capable of going a lot faster. But most of the time in regular combat scenarios, you're gonna be going a lot slower than that. So we'll just say the average speed that a modern tank today can go is give or take 40 to 45 miles an hour. This tank is going a little bit faster than that, but obviously I would have just assumed that your player character is just putting his fucking foot to the floor. Which, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. One thing I would like to point out with the, the mobility and everything of the tank is actually the engine sound effects. I noticed while looking at the, the store page for the Rhino tank in the Warstock Cash and Carry, it does specifically mention on the page that this tank uses a gas turbine engine. The American Abrams tank is by far the most famous tank in the world to use a turbine engine. It's not the only tank in the world by, the stretch of, by any stretch of the imagination that uses a turbine engine, but it is the most widely known. So that's of course lending a lot of credibility to this being some sort of Abrams Leopard hybrid. So this tank has a turbine engine for sure but we'll notice when we got in and as we're driving around the sound effects that they've used are definitely not that of a turbine engine it is definitely just some generic uh, diesel engine in fact it almost sounds like the exact same engine sound effects that they use in the semi trucks in the game which is severely underwhelming and also not realistic if this tank has a turbine engine it would sound way different. Turbine engines have a very distinct uh, whine to them, especially upon startup. It is an orgasmic experience, first of all, but also you can tell that it is not any sort of engine sound that you would hear on any other vehicle. So the fact that knowing that this tank has a turbine engine and then our player character gets into the tank, turns the key, <laughs> tanks don't have keys by the way, the engine just kind of sputters to life and it's just some kind of generic, basically 18 wheeler engine sound effects uh, is extremely disappointing actually. Pretty realistic maneuverability for a tank. Uh, again, we're no tanker in his right mind would ever drive a tank like this, but in this wacky scenario where our character is just putting his foot to the floor and just turning it and turning it as wacky as he can, tanks are physically capable of pulling off maneuvers like this. This isn't really anything too crazy. I do find it quite weird that we seem to have a much smaller turning circle going in reverse than we do going forwards. I'm not quite sure why that is. You can certainly run over cars in a tank, but they will not explode instantly in a giant ball of fire, and your tank will not le certainly not be sent 15 feet in the air by doing it. Oh. 
So let, let's talk for two seconds about the, the ammunition, what, what this tank seems to be firing. It is a common trope in video games, movies, in that every time we seem to fire the cannon, our round goes out, and every time it hits something, it explodes in, in this big extravagant ball of fire. It should definitely be noted that Tank ammunition does not always just explode when it hits something. There are many different types of ammunition for tanks, many of which do explode and many of which don't. The most common type of ammunition we could see that might behave this way is some sort of high explosive ammunition, high explosive, high explosive anti-tank, a high explosive squash head. In this situation where you're shooting at cars, uh, that actually would be quite a, an appropriate tank ammunition to use. But the fact that they haven't modeled any sort of variation in the ammunition types, many, many games do this. I know the Battlefield games do this, TA is doing this, and I think Halo does it too. A lot of other games just have the tank shoot just generic, shoot it, it hits something and explodes ammunition. And the idea with from the game development side of it is that explosion does a lot of damage. So explosion make health bar go down faster than non-explosion and regular bullets. Ha ha ha. We understand how tanks work. In reality, if you're fighting other armored vehicles, you're not looking for damage. You're looking for penetration. And if you just hit the tank with a shell that immediately explodes and destroys itself as soon as it makes contact with the armor, you're not achieving any penetration. So it's not a good idea to be shooting at other tanks or other armored vehicles with high explosive ammunition. So we can give it a pass. It's a video game. They're not modeling super intricate and complex uh, armor penetration systems. They're not modeling interior damage and components and all these things. I get it. You just want to fire something that explodes, does a lot of damage and looks pretty. I perfectly understand that. But what's very interesting about GTA 5, what they've done here in particular, is this ammunition seems to explode in midair after it's been fired at, and at a pretty consistent distance as well. Now, for gameplay reasons, I know they've done this because they obviously don't want you to be able to snipe other tanks from, you know, all the way across the map. So they've limited the effective range of your cannon by just making the round uh, explode prematurely before it hits anything. I know the missiles do this, your RPGs do this in GTA. It's, it's their way of, of limiting the range of the vehicle. First of all, that is a pathetic range if that really is what they're limiting this, this tank to. For a tank to only be able to shoot that far is sad. You might as well not have a tank. It almost seems like they're using some kind of proximity fuse time delay ammunition or something like that, where the shell leaves the barrel. The ammunition can have some sort of proximity sensor to where if it's in proximity of something, it'll detect that around it and explode prematurely. Needless to say, there aren't very many ammunition types that I can think of that are loaded into conventional main battle tanks that would explode like this in midair. The only ammunition that would really need to do something like that is an anti-aircraft ammunition. If these were just regular high explosive shells, then they would just fly until they hit something and then they would explode. But the fact that they're exploding in midair means that there is something else going on with those shells. The only real ground application I can think of something like that is maybe you're shooting over a trench of some kind and the shell explodes over top of the trench and blows material, fragments, whatever it is, down into the trench. The United States is currently developing ammunition that can do stuff like that. One fun little coincidence of this high explosive ammunition that detonates in midair thing that we have going here is that this actually means that this tank makes for a very good anti-aircraft weapon. This is actually really, really cool. For all the ragging that I've been doing on this tank so far today, uh, this is actually something I will give mad props for. Rockstar has actually bothered to model the, the cannon barrel as a physical object in, in the world, and it can actually interact with things. You see we're, we're knocking down fences, knocking over lamp posts, we're swatting cop cars around with our tank barrel, which is very cool because most video game tanks don't behave this way. The cannon barrel is usually just a clip phase through, no physics actually engraved in it. Even in some super realistic simulation games, the tank barrel is not actually modeled as a physical object. You can't actually hit anything with it. You can't actually collide it against anything. Even in very, very popular tank games like War Thunder, the tank barrel doesn't have any physics. You can just park yourself up next to a building, turn your turret sideways, and your barrel will just clip through the building, and then drive out from behind the building, and your barrel clips out of it, and then you can take a shot at somebody and then back right back up. Keep your turret facing that way and your barrel will just clip straight through the building again and you don't even have to worry about it. I can see why most tank games don't do it is because it is just an extra piece of your tank to have to worry about. It can be a little bit frustrating to have to constantly bang your tank barrel into things and then have to worry about what effect that could have on your tank, possibly damaging your barrel. But also it can create for some kind of wacky physics breaking moments. 
We see even even in GTA, there are moments where you know we're hitting a, a building or something with our barrel, some an object that can't be destroyed or moved, and so we hit it with our tank there hard enough, and our whole tank just kind of whacks out and flaps up off the road and kind of spins for a second because the physics just doesn't quite know how to deal with that. And even very amusingly, we actually managed to get our cannon barrel stuck in the the hole of a gate <laughs> in the back of a gate at a security checkpoint uh which is really that's really cool that you can do that it's really not something you see very often in games actually at all it's i think it's worth giving props here the implementation is a little bit spotty but honestly i'm just impressed overall that they even bothered with it So we've had our fun, we've had our, uh, our our rampage here in the tank, killing as many cops as we can. But now we get a chance to actually look at the destroyed tank, which is cool because now we've got some uh, panels and bits that are removed and we can get kind of closer looks at the tank. So obviously the very first thing I'm noticing here is, again, the tracks. Lending more credibility to the fact that these tracks are not physically modeled at all. Uh, they have no any detail fidelity to them whatsoever they are very simply just floating in a perfectly straight line um, which means either a that these tracks are amazingly well tensioned or b they are not real <laughs> if you wanted your tracks to be sitting straight up like that your real tanks in, in the modern day have what are called return rollers but this tank doesn't have any return rollers because rockstar didn't bother with it they just went with a straight flat uh, geometric shape of track and then just apply a texture to it that rotates to make it look like the tank is driving but it's clearly not. Not sort of any interior modeled on the inside of the tank. Not that I was expecting one, but still disappointing that there isn't. So overall final impressions of the Rhino tank, I'm a little bit torn. On one hand, I do like the design. It looks quite nice. It functions as a tank in a video game would. On the macro, this tank is fine. It's serviceable. I wouldn't say it's an impressive by any stretch of the imagination, but you can look at that and say, oh yeah, that's a functional tank. It's when you dive into the details that you start to see sus things. Things such as the riveted armor, which is the probably the biggest red flag on this tank by far, the hatch that clips you into the fenders, the uh, non-functional periscopes, the gunner sight that doesn't actually exist. I think for an original design, this could be okay, but the fact that they are very obviously trying to portray a realistic Western style tank, I think is what's really throwing it off. As in terms of what tank it really is, uh, this tank has almost no exact concrete traits of any one tank that I've seen. The closest thing we got is the gun, being uh, very obviously reminiscent of the Rheinmetall 120mm, which by the way, the name of the tank Rhino might be a reference to Rheinmetall, and the tracks being very clearly American style chevron tracks and those really tell us what we need to know it's very clearly a mixture of a leopard to a four and an abrams gas turbine engine just like an abrams american style tracks like an abrams or a leopard Rhine Metal 120 millimeter gun just like the abrams and the leopard clearly a very leopard to a four inspired turret but overall, the tank doesn't have any specific pinpoint details of a Leopard 2A4. In fact, a lot of people have been able to compare the tank to other modern tanks. The Japanese Type 90, which I think it does share a much, much more similar resemblance to. And even there's some South African prototype tanks that people have compared it to. And again, the, the resemblance is striking. But especially when looking at things like the engine deck or the driver's position, or again, the more fine details of the turret itself, I can't find any one specific tank in real life that this really looks like it was modeled after. That being said, it is definitely a Leopard 2A4. And the reason I say that is because, to go on a quick side tangent, as if this entire video isn't a side tangent in and of itself, this being some kind of Leopard 2A4 or a Leopard Descendant, some kind of Americanized cousin to a Leopard, does actually have some fun historical context. First of all, way back in the 1960s, there was a joint venture between the United States and Germany to make uh, a tank together, known as the MBT-70. Never left prototyping though, it turned out to just not really work for either side, but it was a genuine program for America and Germany to come together and say, let's both use the same tank. It kind of ended up as a weird 
as a, a bit of a square peg and a round hole for both nations. Neither of them were really happy with what it offered. So the MPT-70 was scrapped. America and Germany went their own separate ways. But years later, in the 1970s, when America was running the programs for what they called their third generation MBT, main battle tank programs, when they were looking to replace the M60s, the patents of the Cold War era, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, they hosted this Gen 3 MBT program to find their next tank. And among many of the different tanks that were submitted, the General Motors submission, the Chrysler submission, tanks that would eventually end up being developed into the Abrams in 1980, there was actually a Leopard tank from Germany submitted for that trial to be, to possibly possibly be the new main battle tank of the United States, the third generation main battle tank of the United States. So in the middle of the 1970s, there was a very real chance that they could select a Leopard. And not only that, but the Americans came back and said that the Leopard did meet all the requirements of the trial, but they ultimately found it to be a bit too expensive, and they were really hell-bent on putting the gas turbine engine in their tank, and the Leopard didn't have a gas turbine, so they ended up going with one of the domestic designs. I think it was the Chrysler design that they went with. Now, that design also had a diesel engine, but they ended up shoving a turbine into it anyway, so you could argue why didn't they just buy Leopards and then shove turbine engines in the Leopards, but again, they also thought the Leopard was a bit too expensive, so either way, America didn't end up going with the Leopard. But it's interesting to note that there was a very real possibility that America could have adopted the Leopard 2, specifically the Leopard 2, as their next main battle tank. So seeing a Leopard tank, or at least some kind of Leopard derivative, Leopard long lost cousin in American service is actually not as far of a stretch as you might think. And especially a tank like this that clearly doesn't look exactly like a Leopard, but has some sort of Leopard lineage to it is almost even more realistic as America would have certainly made their own changes to the Leopard after buying them. So this tank is uh, kind of weirdly almost more plausible conceptually and historically than it is practically and realistically in detail. Overall, I like the Rhino tank, it's fun to play, but it has a couple of quirks for me that just kind of push it past the edge of something believable that could actually exist. I could usually give some wacky unrealistic tanks and video games passes, but because that they are specifically trying to portray a real MBT that America could be using, for me it just strays a little bit too far out of detail and realism that the Rhino tank ends up being a good attempt, but there's a lot you could have done differently. Well, that just about does it for this video. Uh, yes, I am recording this outro on a separate day, but whatever, you don't need to know that. Movie magic, this is all being filmed on the same day, shush. This video was actually a lot of fun to make, you know? It's always uh, nice to find an excuse to rant incoherently about tanks, and hopefully with the editing, I've been able to make this uh, somewhat coherent and understandable. But otherwise, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and as always, I hope you guys learned something. Uh, if this is the first video of mine that you're checking out from my channel, I am a tank-focused channel, so if you like tanks, there's plenty of stuff for you here to go ahead and check out all my other channels. And I've got a couple of other things to shout out as well. Namely, I have a Discord, which I mentioned at the beginning of this video. And there'll be links to join in on that Discord in the description down below, as always. I host uh, live streams. I do live stream stuff on my uh, other channel, at 320 live And I'm a part of a podcast. Uh, me, myself, and two other friends from YouTube get together and uh, just talk about stuff. Sometimes we bring up tanks. Sometimes we don't. It's really just, it's a podcast, you know? What do you, what do you expect? So if you like what I do and you like me, go ahead and check out all those things and uh, you can be a part of the, the Edit 320 universe, so to speak. I do have plans to make more of these videos. I've actually already done recording and uh, gameplay for uh, two other tanks for this series. So I will definitely probably be keeping that up. Uh, especially if this video does well. But I don't want to keep you any longer than I already have. This video is already pretty long. So I just want to say thank you guys so much again for watching and uh, happy tanking. That was cool. That's a cool, that's a cool outro. That's a cool thing to say. <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching.